Knapen. Who will stand here at the lectern introducing to you the greatest authors and speakers from the United States. Monique, it's an honor to hand the floor to you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna, for building up this American lecture program to be the best one in Europe. I will gl glad, gladly work hard to live up your expectations. Welcome, Mr. Kaplan. Your presence tonight is very meaningful to our institute. We realize how privileged we are to have a chance to meet you and hear you. As our institute tries to bring the best of America to Amsterdam, it was only a matter of timing and patience to reach the moment when you are able to speak in our program. Thank you for your participation. I would like to thank Publishing House Spectrum and Van Dietmar Book Import for making tonight's events possible. The evening will open with a short introduction by Mr. Rob de Wijk of Klingendaal, um, and he uh, will introduce Robert Kaplan, who will talk about 40 minutes. Shortly before nine, Mr. de Wijk will open the conversation with Mr. Kaplan and give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. There will be microphones uh, available, as you see, throughout the hall. At approximately, approximately 9.30, uh, Reed Vendrick, Chargé d'Affaires of the American Embassy in The Hague, will close the evening. The American Ambassador, Cynthia Snyder, who originally agrees to uh, close the evening, um, asks to be excused for us since um, she uh, has personal reasons for. Uh, Mr. Rob de Wijk, may I ask you to come and have the podium? Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before I start introducing Mr. Kaplan, uh, let me, on behalf of the audience, thank and Wertheim uh, uh, very much for the splendid work done for the Amazon Institute. And let me wish uh, Monique Knapen also on behalf of uh, the audience a very nice time at the Institute and hope you will achieve the same things as your predecessor did. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm very pleased and proud to be invited uh, by the John Adams Institute to present this evening. And I'm even more pleased to introduce to you Robert Kaplan, who recently published his Eastward to Tartany, in case you don't know the book. This is how it looks like. But tonight is about the contents. Um, I read it. Uh, that will not surprise you, I think. It's well written and it's in intriguing. I read it, uh, I have to admit, only very recently. Uh, I read it uh, last week in Belgrade. I uh, had to go to Belgrade to talk with some people in the uh, surroundings of uh, Kosunica, the new president. And uh, I thought it was a very appropriate place uh, to read a book like this. Uh, because it is the kind of place Robert Kaplan wrote about. Um, it is, of course, not about Yugoslavia. He's with the Tartary. Uh, another book he wrote uh, is about that place, uh, Balkan Coast. A very well written and intriguing book as well. Uh, I was really stuck by the book because my approach is quite similar. And moreover, I traveled in the same countries, and I recognize much of what he has written about. I share Kaplan's uh, view that the historical and religious legacy of these countries is very important and explains much about their foreign and domestic politics. It explains the policy choices of their leaders, their behavior, but it also explains much of the people in that part of the world. And these countries are indeed different, and that is why it is so important to read a book like this. They have a different history, they have a different culture, and therefore they have a different norms and different values and a different identity. But here we have a problem. Many Westerners, especially the Dutch, think our, our, our values are universal values, 
But Robert Kaplan's book makes clear that this is not always the case. And that is, I think, why Kaplan's writings are so important and should be read by policy makers and politicians who are usually ignorant of these things. And I hope that Mr. Kaplan will dwell on these important issues tonight. Robert Kaplan is a contributing editor of the Atlantic Monthly, and he offers opinions on current international affairs in, for example, the New York Times. And he already wrote in the 1980s about the coming cataclysm, cataclysm in the Balkans. He is, and you know that all, author of many, many books on travel and foreign affairs, including books on the war in Afghanistan, the famine in Ethiopia, the Balkan crisis, and America's future. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you, Robert Kaplan. Rob, thanks so much for that introduction. And thank you all for inviting me here tonight. Um, it's my fourth or fifth trip to Holland. I can't remember anymore. So I've become fairly familiar with the country and traveling around to Utrecht, to Texel, to other places over the past 30 years. And it's especially, Steve, can't hear? The mic's on. Well, all right, I'll try it here. Um, this is my, um, it's my fourth or fifth trip to Holland. Uh, I started coming here over 30 years ago as a tourist, so I feel that I've gotten to know the country fairly well, uh, in a way. And it's particularly gratifying. <laughs> Sorry, it's not starting out well. Uh, okay. <clears throat> it's particularly gratifying to speak at the John Adams Institute, because John Adams, though he was not as romantic and charismatic as Thomas Jefferson, or as intellectually exciting as Alexander Hamilton, is probably one of the greatest founding fathers and very much a conservative realist, um, which many people don't, uh, don't understand. But I think John Adams's anonymity is going to end in a few months very fast and very dramatically with a publication of a new book about his life. So uh, without further ado, let me get into the subject that I'll be speaking about tonight. A hundred years ago, there was um, a general, um, Otto von Bismarck's chief general, uh, Helmut von Molke, who was one of the few people who could talk to Bismarck and tell him right in front of his face that he was wrong. Um, what many people did not know about von Moltke, though, who was the, uh, the real star of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, was that in his younger years, von Moltke was a travel writer. And in the 1830s, he traveled through the Ottoman Empire, through Anatolia, the Caucasus, Mesopotamia, and he recorded his observations, and he described the landscape, the scenery, but always with the aim of using it to talk about the, pro the strategic problems that Prussia would face in the East in the future. So he used travel writing as kind of an entertaining technique to talk about political analysis and history and other things. And I found that von Molke was a very good model to use, um, much better than any, any of my contemporary travel writers. Um, because most contemporary travel writers just think of travel to describe interesting adventures, cuisine, architecture, appreciate the, uh, the local culture. But von Molke offered another example that you could use it to talk about politics, to make general observations from the ground up, other than from the top down, the way so many policy analysts do so. So I made a trip through basically what used to be the Turkish Empire and the shadow belt around it, and also into what used to be the Soviet Empire. So my trip through what I call the Greater Near East, in, I encountered the ruins of two empires, the Ottoman Empire and the Soviet Empire. Now, before, during and after World War II and throughout the Cold War, we thought of the Middle East 
as just an Arab-Israeli conflict affair, with maybe Persia or Iran thrown in. What many people don't realize is, or don't remember, is that for many hundreds of years, up until the early 20th century, the Middle East began where the Turkish Empire began, in the heart of Europe, where the Habsburg Empire began and the Ottoman rule started. And it, so the Middle East included the Balkans, it included what we've come to think of in our lifetimes as the Middle East, and it also included Central Asia and the Caucasus. So I decided on this grander definition of the Middle East at the end of the Cold War when the Balkans, the Caucasus, and Central Asia were no longer locked inside the, the Soviet Warsaw Pact prisons, so to speak. Um, and, and I felt that this was a very important area because it's where 70% of the world's strategic oil reserves and 40% of its natural gas reserves are, are, are located. And, and what I did was, so I started in the Balkans and I ended in Central Asia. In terms of modern political terms, I covered every, a lot of places that were east of the newly expanded NATO, west of China, south of Russia. Um, in this whole area that is now up for grabs. And it included, in terms of news headlines, three areas, and I'm going to break the talk down three ways. It included the Balkans, the standard issue Arab-Israeli Middle East, and it included the Caucasus in Central Asia, the ruins of the ex-Soviet Union on the southern tier. Interestingly enough, um, I think the Balkans are going to be the least interesting part of my talk tonight because the Balkans already happened in the 1990s and what's left is kind of the cleaning up operation or the mopping up operation, kind of like Lebanon was 10 years ago after, uh, after a decade of war. Um, Traveling through the Balkans for the first time in a decade, because it had been a decade since I had finished Balkan Ghosts, I finished writing it in 1991 in January, about five months before the start of the war in the former Yugoslavia. And at that time, when I wrote and researched Balkan Ghosts, Yugoslavia was nowhere in the news. The media was obsessed with Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Lebanon, and was just starting to get interested since the fall of the Berlin Wall in Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic. Um, this time I decided to ignore Yugoslavia because it had been so covered in depth that there was really nothing new to say. So I went back to Romania and Bulgaria, countries that were still, in my opinion, undercover. And in a nutshell, here is what I found. When the Cold War ended, we were all told that Europe was being reunited, that the division of Europe was over. Well, I found out, kind of ground-truthing the situation, that that's not true. That all that happened was that Europe was redivided. Um, and it was redivided re along older, deeper, more intractable historical lines. Um, when it was decided to expand NATO to Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary, those were all Protestant Catholic countries of Christendom, of the Old West. Um, and if you look at the map of the newly expanded NATO now, you'll see that it resembles fairly closely the map of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, so that the old Christendom was reestablished, and that those areas that were part of the old Ottoman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, that were either Muslim or Eastern Orthodox were left out. So we've got back now the old division of Europe, more or less. The NATO expansion redivided Europe and institutionalized that division. Um, and you see it visually when you cross from Hungary into Romania. Since 1989, Hungary has gotten 12 times per capita more foreign business investment than Romania. Hungary has gotten 24 times per capita more investment from the United States compared to Romania. Um, the, Romanian, uh, the average Romanian income is only one-third that of hung Hungary's. 70% nearly, or 65% of Hungarian banks have been privatized. They work by international standards. 
Almost no Romanian banks have been privatized so far. Now, throughout the Cold War, Hungary was always wealthier than Romania. Crossing from Hungary to Romania, even in the midst of the Cold War, you went downhill in terms of economic standards of living, freedom. Hungary had a more liberalized version of communism since 1968, right up to 89. But this division, this gap in income levels, in westernization, whatever you want to call it, has grown dramatically since 1989 and particularly since Hungary has been admitted to NATO. Because NATO admission means good product approval for a country, more business investment. Um, and um, <clears throat> when you cross from Hungary into Romania, the most important thing that you see, and this is what I found everywhere, I found this in Bulgaria, in Georgia, in Azerbaijan. Whereas in Central Europe, where, and Hungary was the last outpost of Central Europe at the beginning of my journey. You see development everywhere. Yes, it's more sophisticated and wealthier in Budapest, but even in the most outlying villages of Hungary now, you see cash machines, you see new building, you see new cars, you see newly paved roads, you, you see su new signage for computer repair. Again, it's not as sophisticated as Budapest, but the development pattern is a normal one. However, when you cross into Romania and you continue along that journey that I made for most of the part, all of the development is concentrated in a few square miles of the downtown of one or two or three cities. And beyond that point, there is still a wasteland where nothing has changed since 1989, where pavement stops, where living standards plummet dramatically. And since most most journalists, diplomats, business people tend to only visit the capital in one or two other cities. They get an overly optimistic view of the situation. So that many of these countries through which I traveled are following an older, more medieval pattern of development. Um, where it's, you're seeing the recreation of these pulsing westernized city-states that you meet every few hundred miles along the way. And between them, there's nothing. There's no development, um, and, 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 and nothing has really changed. Um, now, the biggest decision that the Bush administration will have to make, and it's a decision that will be made relatively soon, will be whether to lobby for a further expansion of NATO uh, in time for the, the next NATO summit in Prague in 2002, which will be an historic summit because it will be the first NATO summit in an ex-Warsaw Pact capital. And the decision probably has not been made yet, but it will be a momentous one, and there are a lot of risks involved. And I believe after making this trip, that while we can have legitimate arguments about how fast NATO should expand and how fast the EU should expand and what should be the pace and kind and strategy of that expansion, ultimately, I believe that Europe has no choice but to expand eastward, to move its institutions eastward to the Black Sea, to erase and bridge this cultural, civilizational, economic divide that I've just said a few words about. Um, you know, the United States was a country that it wasn't clear for many decades whether it would expand to the Pacific. It might have stopped at the Mississippi River. Spain would have kept the southern part of the West had there not been a Mexican War. Um, the British would have kept the Oregon Territory. And the temperate zone of North America would have become a kind of playing field of the great powers. And had that happened, the United States never would have become a world power. Um, but America expanded to the Pacific, and so that there was no great power conflict on the continent, and so America was able to develop its economy peacefully and in the process become a great power. I think in the long run, if Europe remains divided as it is now, um, there could be trouble. There could be great power conflict. And I'm thinking ahead decades. But when you think about NATO expansion, you do have to think ahead decades. So um, in terms of the Balkans, um, uh, I came to the strong conclusion that the, the, the Europe project of moving Europe eastward, its institutions, can never be declared over. 
Uh, these countries to the east always have to be given the incentive that they can join up that way to encourage the best in their politics rather than the worst in their politics. And the Balkans are lucky in a way because they're next door to Central Europe. And because they're next door to the West, we have real incentives to offer that have meaning, uh, that have credibility um, to encourage their politics. Um, now let me move into the Middle East. Um, in 1978, um, the United States gave the impression that the most important thing that occurred that year was the Camp David peace accords between Egypt and Israel. Well, it turned out it wasn't the most important thing that happened in the Middle East that year. The most important thing that changed the Middle East that was much more important than the cold and anemic peace between Israel and Egypt was the Iranian Revolution, which was something unexpected that very few people predicted that changed this, this Muslim powerhouse of 60-odd million people, um, turned them from being pro-American completely to the other direction. And it, but it was a process that came from the ground up. It was generated from the people, from the masses, and overtook the elites. And it showed that elites cannot engineer good results from, from on top downward. Camp David was about the engineering of results by elite. The Iranian revolution is bubbling up from, it was something about bubbling up from the bottom up. And something bubbling up from the bottom is what I experienced throughout Syria, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, and other countries um, in the region. I've been traveling through Syria and Lebanon for 25 years now. And I'll never forget the first time I crossed by land from Turkey and went from northern Syria, which is Aleppo, and traveled all the way to southern central Syria, Damascus. And in those days, in the 1970s, it was about a five-hour drive or so, and it was all rural countryside. There was no development. You left Aleppo, and then you got to Damascus after traveling through pretty countryside. Nowadays, the construction never stops. It pretty soon, in another decade or so, there'll be one urban corridor from Aleppo to Damascus. Lebanon, it's even more dramatic. Lebanon no longer exists. It's Greater Beirut. And Greater Beirut starts near the Israeli border in the south and goes all the way to Tripoli, to the, um, to the Syrian border in the north. There's construction all along the way. Greater Amman starts about an hour north of reaching Amman and goes way south of Amman. Um, so what we're really talking about when we talk about the Arab world is not so much states, but large metroplexes, city-states coming into being, where the, the Arab politics of the future will not be so much state politics, but messy, municipal, complicated politics of big cities. And as everybody knows, running an urbanized society is far more difficult than running a rural society. That is because urban societies require complex infrastructure of potable water, electricity, sewage, police, all kinds of other things that rural societies do not need. Rural societies are less susceptible to food and bread price rises, because they can often grow their own produce uh, 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 locally, right on the ground. But urban societies are very susceptible to this. And what makes the situation even more difficult is that while world population as a whole, it, the rate of growth of world population is going down, and that ultimately, sometime in the mid-21st century, we'll see an aging, graying world, even in sub-Saharan Africa. For the next 10 years, about 30 or 40 countries around the world are still going to grow so fast that their youth populations, are, in percentage terms, are going to get bigger and bigger. And particularly in Syria, Lebanon, the West Bank, Gaza, for the next 10 years, we're going to see an increasing youth bulge. Um, in other words, a larger and larger proportion of these increasingly urbanized societies are going to be composed of young men between the ages of 15 and 29. And anyone who watches television and wants to find the one link 
between political violence in Indonesia or political violence in Cote d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, or political violence in Gaza and Lebanon or in, or in the West Bank. What unites it all is that all of this is conducted by young men. And so it's kind of like police departments can very vaguely predict crime rates by looking what the youth population will be. Um, you can get a gauge, some kind of idea about the levels of political violence by looking at the demographics in the near future. And when you look at these countries' economies, what you see is there are not going to be just sufficient jobs or educational opportunities for many of these young men. So we're looking at societies that are going to be more urban, with more and more young guys, with not all that much to do. Um, so I think we're going to see quite a lot of unrest. Um, Syria has one of the world's highest birth rates. Its population doubles about every 20 years. Um, Syria held three free and fair democratic elections in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Couldn't get more democratic, no problem there, but each election broke down along ethnic sectarian lines. Um, the dictatorships in Syria, the late Hafez al-Assad, they didn't just emerge because they were Syrians or bad people. It was because Assad was the force of nature that kind of filled the vacuum after the failure of three free and fair democratic elections and other dictators. Um, so it is unclear what Syria's future is going to be like. It took Yugoslavia 10 years to unravel after Tito's death. Um, Syria, like Yugoslavia, is divided ethnically, its ethnic groups are specific to certain territories, um, with, a, as I said, a growing youth population, more and more urbanized. If you want to see the Middle East and the real problems of the Middle East, you go to a little town called Zarqa, north of Amman, Jordan. And in, Zarqa is one of these places, if you're a tourist, you'll never go there because it's like a neither nor bad, badly urbanized industrial place about 45 minutes north of Amman, but you never leave Amman because Amman's getting so big. And what you see is miles of low-end markets with stores selling car batteries, shoelaces, flashlights, automobile tools, and you just see nuts hordes of young men hanging around without much to do, and women who every year, you know, every few years when I go back are increasingly veiled and covered. Now, about 70% of the Jordanian population lives in places like Zarqa. Um, and as there is less and less potable water, usable water, because water resources are being used up, that cuts farming. So there's less farming, so there's even more rush into the cities, to places like Zarqa. So these governments are in, are in a rush. They've got to provide jobs and opportunities for all these young people, or else this unrest that we've seen in the last year or so, regardless of the efforts of politicians, is going to be very hard to contain. Um, in fact, looking over the whole Middle East, part of which isn't covered in this book and part that's covered in other books, what I see in the future is many messy Mexico-style scenarios. But without Mexico's benefit of having a long border with the United States to export its labor, and without Mexico's institution building, because Mexican institutions are far more developed than those in many Middle Eastern countries. In other words, I see a gradual, messy democratization process where the next generation of autocrats will not have the luxury to rule quite as autocratically as the present generation. But neither will these places be venues for stable, de uh, for stable democracy. And that's going to make it even harder for the Western policymaker. Because the Western policymaker is used to proclaiming his support of democracy, but knows that he or she relies on stability in the Middle East by dealing with autocrats, by dealing with one, with one or two or three phone and fax numbers and email addresses, with just a few, a half dozen people at the most that need to be convinced that during a time of crisis so that crises can be averted and decisions can be made in the same style of court diplomacy that was practiced over 150 years ago and more. But in the future, 
due to democratization, which is unstoppable, which is unstoppable, I believe. We may have, as in Mexico, about 40 or 50 people we'll have to convince in each country. 40 or 50 junior officers, uh, politicians, and others, um, with, with, um, without sufficient experience, all having different goals and ideals. And so de dealing with the Middle East during a time of increasing freedom is going to be harder. That democratization does not necessarily need lead to more stability. Um, I didn't cover all that much the Arab, I mean the Palestinian-Israeli crisis in the book, because one of the things I like to do as an author is not to follow the herd, to kind of stay away from what's in the news and run alone in the other direction and try to look ahead. But going back for Going back to the West Bank, uh, going, uh, spending some time in Israel, it occurred to me that what we call the peace process is really a divorce process. Um, it's a long and messy divorce. Um, and I think that whoever is Prime Minister of Israel, ultimately, there will be some so sort of separation, some sort of withdrawal um, from the, ur the highly populated urban areas of the West Bank, um, so that in the future, the Israeli military can fight the kind of wars it's good at now, high-tech warfare, and stay away from the low-tech warfare of having thrown stone at it um, by, um, um, by civilians. So I think at some point, we will see a separation separation. And when we see that separation, if I had to make a guess, I'd say we'd see a kind of independent Palestinian state that has no control of its airspace above, no control of its main highways. Um, and, and, you know, for years and years we were told there would either be a greater Israel or an independent Palestinian state. I believe we're going to have both. Uh, we're going to have this weak, independent Palestinian state, but we will have a greater Israel in terms of a, a pulsing economy along the Tel Aviv-Haifa coastal corridor, which is becoming a center for worldwide high tech um, that will like draw in the economies of, uh, of other parts of the Middle East. The real greater Israel is not the West Bank settlements, which contribute nothing to the Israeli economy, but which are a burden, um, but, but this growing megalopolis, this metroplex that stretches from south of Tel Aviv all the way to the Lebanese border um, and ultimately if there were a comprehensive peace treaty would go right up to Beirut because the Lebanese already have a highway they're ready to connect to come um, to come right down to Haifa and if we have that we'll have a dynamic coastal region very much like ancient Phoenicia um, where the coastal cities of Beirut and Tel Aviv will have more in common with each other in terms of their cosmopolitan lifestyle than with their more conservative religious capitals in the dry, mountainous interior like Damascus and Jerusalem. Um, let me switch to the Caucasus for the last part of my talk. Um, you know that when, when Alexander the Great died, his generals carved up the empire. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Politburo members and others carved up parts of the ex-Soviet Union. And you had people like the, Geor the ethnic Georgian, Edward Shevardnadze, eventually going back to his native Georgia. And you had the ethnic Azeri Turk, Haidar Aliyev, going back to uh, Azerbaijan eventually. You had central committee men like uh, Sapa Murad Niyazov, uh, take over Turkmenistan because that was his ethnic homeland. And so that the differences between these countries are often the differences between these two men. And I spent considerable time in, 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 uh, in, two, in two places in the Caucasus, Georgia and Azerbaijan. And the differences between them were the differences between Edward Shevardnadze in Georgia and Haidar Aliyev in Azerbaijan, which were in fact the differences between the Brezhnev and Andropov Politburo and the, uh, and the Gorbachev Politburo. Because uh, whereas Aliyev in Azerbaijan who came from the bad old corrupt days of Brezhnev, um, Shevardnadze came from the reformist, liberalizing reformist era of Gorbachev. And that is ultimately why Georgia is further on the way to building democratic institutions than Azerbaijan is. Um, let me talk for a few minutes about Georgia, then Azerbaijan, then Armenia, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, there are basically three famous Georgians in the 20th century, were 
Um, Stalin, Yosef uh, Jugashvili, who is, who is an ethnic Georgian. Um, Lavrenti Berrier, a Berrier, who is Stalin's kind of combination Himmler and Eichmann. Um, and then there was Edward Shevardnadze. And interestingly, Shevardnadze practiced the similar Machiavellian tactics of Beria and Stalin. Um, he was a survivor. Um, he, he was able to grasp the essentials of the situation, manipulate the people, and move up. Um, he was a secret policeman in Georgia. Um, he, you know, he came from the security services, the interior ministry. But because he came of age during a different historical era, he knew that his self-interest, his naked self-interest, lay in liberalization rather than in repression. And so together with Mikhail Gorbachev and Alexander Yakovlev, who, had, became, who was, had been the Soviet ambassador to Canada, the three of them basically invented perestroika and glasnost. Um, after the Soviet Union collapsed, because in the process of liberalizing the Soviet system, it led to its collapse because the system, it turned out, was unreformable. Um, Shevardnadze eventually went back to his native Georgia, where he found out that running Georgia was much more difficult than trying to run the world as foreign minister of the Soviet Union. Um, since um, leading Georgia, there have been 19 plans against his life and two plots that were actually carried out, uh, leaving him partially hard of hearing, uh, killing some people. Um, George is a very unstable place. And when Shevardnadze was invited back to take over Georgia to provide some legitimacy to this hydra-headed mafioso gangland regime, there was this kind of idea that he would be manipulated by these various mafia chiefs. It turned out that Shevardnadze manipulated them, put one after the other in jail, and then took over the country himself. Um, what Georgia taught me was that Shakespeare, Shakespeare knows more about politics than political scientists do. Um, because who, who did Shevardnadze take over from? What had brought Georgia to civil war and ethnic regional mafia leadership? It was a reformist, dissident, intellectual um, patriot, Zviad Gamzakhordia, who stood for everything that was good um, in terms of, in terms of uh, in, in the, way, the way the Westerners look at moral values. But, <clears throat> but he was manipulated by his wife in a fashion very similar to Macbeth. Um, and he was simply incapable of leadership. And so Georgia fell apart. So to restore civil society to Georgia required an ex-KGB chief um, uh, to, um, to come in. And, and, and Shevardnadze used his, poli you know, his interior ministry techniques to bring stability to Georgia, and then in the last five years or so to start to build gradually democratic institutions. There's a parliament there that works, the judicial system that's starting to emerge. And Shevardnadze's strategy is very simple, pure physical survival. If he can survive another five years or so, perhaps some of these institutions can develop enough so that he won't be needed anymore, that the survival of the Georgian state will not be synonymous with he himself. And, um, and so we'll see what happens there. Um, the problem is that a few miles outside of Tbilisi, the capital, Shevardnadze has no control over much of anything. Um, Georgia looks small on the map, but when you travel through it, it's a vast, sprawling mini-empire of different ethnicities. Now, Georgia is a model of stability and, and the Enlightenment compared to Azerbaijan. Um, that's because while Shevardnadze restored stability to Azerbaijan, when he again took over from a democratically elected leader, uh, Ebulfez uh, Ebul Elchibe, who also brought his country into warfare and destruction. Shevardnadze restored stability, but in the last five or six years, he's done nothing with that stability. Unlike Shevardnadze, he has not begun to build democratic institutions or institutions of any kind. Um, it's a one-man, boring, banal, insipid kleptocracy, personality cult, um, where 
mil millions upon millions of dollars of oil revenues have flowed in, flowed in to enrich a few square miles of downtown Baku with new, with new restaurants, theme restaurants, in fact, um, posh new boutiques, marble sidewalks, the playground for the new oil elite, um, new hotels, uh, fresh flowers are flown in from Europe every day. Um, but then the minute you get into the suburbs of Baku, uh, they're still surviving on a water and sewage system that the British Army built in, in, in about uh, seven, uh, 80 years ago. And in the rest of Azerbaijan, there's very little development, and some of the development you see is paid for by the Iranians, who seem to have more concern about the Georgian countryside, I mean the Az Azerbaijan countryside, than the Azeri government does. Um, what all this adds up to, to me, is trouble. Um, and it does because Azerbaijan and the, and the Caspian Sea region in general is in a similar state of affairs as Saudi Arabia in the 40s and 50s when big oil came on then. But there are three things that these countries don't have that Saudi Arabia did have that allowed Saudi Arabia to survive and come through this tumultuous economic and cultural change. Saudi Arabia was surrounded by desert, so its adversaries were far away and fairly non-threatening, and they weren't really adversaries. Um, Saudi Arabia had primogeniture. It had a line of succession, a royal line of succession, which actually provides stability. It's quite a good, convenient thing because it narrows down who the next president or king is going to be to just a few people. Um, and Saudi Arabia had no pretensions to democracy at the time, which, while bad from our standpoint of view, did provide stability. Um, Azerbaijan and the Caspian region is different. Uh, Azerbaijan, for instance, is surrounded by close, real enemies. Armenia, which it fought a very bloody war with um, in the early and mid-1990s. Russia to the north in Chechnya and Dagestan. Um, also, Azerbaijan has no primogeniture. It has no line of succession, no legitimate uh, coming to power. Um, and yet, the, the president is trying to engineer his son. Um, to, to, to succeed him. This is far more destabilizing than when Saudi Arabia experienced. And there are pinings, yearnings, hopes, ambition for a democracy in Azerbaijan, which would be very good if the democratic opposition wasn't so irresponsible. Um, the democratic opposition talks about uh, Azeri nationalism in northern Iran, about taking back parts of uh, ethnic Azeri territory in northern Iran. Um, it's people who are inexperienced. I see a coming kind of conflict between Iran and Azerbaijan for a variety of reasons, because Iran is not so much a one ethnic Persian state, but a mini empire of other ethnicities. And as big oil comes online in the northern part of Azerbaijan, it's going to be an attraction force for the millions of Azeri Turks south of the border, especially with uh, extremist nationalist politics that will accompany democratization. Uh, so, and if Aliyev, who's had triple heart bypass surgery, were to die today, um, I think you would find a real clash between the Russians, Russian interests, Turkish interests, and Iranian interests in the area. Now, you know, I was in Armenia uh, a few days before and after. The, um, there was a shootout in the Armenian parliament where I believe, if I remember correctly, seven cabinet members and others were assassinated. And on the day afterwards, Armenia was still more stable than Georgia or Azerbaijan on a good day. That you could travel throughout Armenia on paved roads, you didn't have to pay policemen bribes, the borders ran in a very civil way, there was no funny business. And as Armenians explained to me, that's because Armenia is about 94% ethnic Armenian. In a part of the world with weak institutions, the, uh, one ethnicity provides the kind of cultural glue that gives stability. Or as several Armenians said to me very cynically, um, because we're only one ethnic group, there's only one mafia here, not several, fighting for power. Um, um, also, what, another thing I learned in Armenia is that organized, dynamic, wealthy diasporas are much more strategically important than big oil in a globalized era of mass communications. 
When you travel through uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, where I ended my journey, which is a part of Azerbaijan that was, but ethnically Armenian, that was taken by Armenian forces during the war there in the early and mid-1990s. Uh, it's like driving into the West Bank, because you suddenly see in this poor area these magnificent new highways built on American standards with night guardrails and mirrors when you come around uh, turns. And all this was paid for by fundraising drives, by Armenians in Los Angeles and other parts of the United States and the world. Um, and it's a, this war with Azerbaijan was won to a large extent by the diaspora, which was very organized and, and, um, and had money. And I think diaspora is going to become incru in increasingly important in an era when, because of mass communications, they can, they're, they're not linked to territory. They've defeated geography. Um, you know, a diaspora in one part of the world can help a diaspora um, in another part of the world. Well, to wrap up very quickly a few points, Points. I can't tell you what the map of the Caucasus and the Central Asia and the Middle East is going to look like in 20 or 30 years because so many of these countries had flimsy institutions, so it's hard to know what kind of regime, if any, will survive. I know that they'll always be in Armenia because it's an ethnic it, it, it's an ethnic state, whereas Georgia and Azerbaijan have a history of separate khanates and principalities. Um, I think that um, if we do have emerging successful democratic institutions in a number of publics, they will be supported by strong oligarchical military security and business elites behind the scenes. And so that they'll be called democracies and we will go along with the lie, but they will really be mixed regimes, kind of hybrid regimes that will have elements of democracy and elements of military security rule. Um, a hundred years ago, I think it was Alfred Nobel controlled the northern part of the Black Sea and Standard Oil of New Jersey virtually had sovereignty of the southern part um, after oil was discovered in Baku in the late 19th century. I think we're going to see a similar kind of company big corporate sovereignties emerge along Caspian Sea pipeline routes where, and this brings me to my final conclusion, if you can get any idea of what the map of the greater Middle East will be like in 30 or 40 years, go back to the eighth book of Thucydides, the Peloponnesian War, where Sparta won, but it was so weakened that when it won that it became basically a vassal state of greater Persia. So that Persia ruled the western part of its empire through the Spartans. And whereas all this region fell under the Persian Empire, there were minor empires and principalities within it. So that sovereignty was very subtle. Instead of strong, bold lines through the map of the Middle East, it was all these broken, thin lines of one kind of sovereignty overlapping the other in a very subtle way. And we may see that in the future. In we may have corporate sovereignties, state sovereignties, city-state, regional, Hanate sovereignties. Uh, well, we, we may see a kind of community develop between Beirut and Tel, and Tel Aviv. And you know, that may be the best prospect for peace and prosperity and, and, um, and stability. A kind of sovereignty that is so subtle it often doesn't have to be declared and allows people to have different kinds of identity. So that, for instance, ethnic Albanians and ethnic Slavs can live on the same street in Skopje, but if they choose, have different passports within a greater European community in 30 years. Um, so rather than, I mean, th this is the good side of chaos because, it, you know, because the, the, fra the fragment, the kind of dissolution, the weakening of the modern nation state system, if it happens slowly and gradually, may, may lead to a new kind of order that's better suited um, for the future. Thank you very much. Hello? You hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right.
Mai bunyi. I, I really hope the microphone works, but I think it yes, does. Yes, I think it does now. <laughs> okay. Yes, functions fine. Thank you. Well, thank you, Robert. Uh, I think this uh, this was really excellent. Um, I think you are truly a, a remarkable American. Uh, not only because uh, you used almost no speaking notes, uh, but even more because you traveled, and you traveled a lot in uh, many countries. And uh, you visited uh, uncomfortable, nasty countries uh, like uh, the ones you just talked about. How come you are so interested in traveling, and especially traveling in these kind of countries? Louder, louder, louder. Yeah. Yeah, but then we need a microphone. <laughs> yes. Um, can they? Um, can you hear me? All right. The, um, um, okay. Ro well, that's most important. Okay. Uh, Rob's question was, why do I travel? Uh, so Especially much. in these countries. Yeah, because look, all of our minds work differently. But the way my mind works is that I get ideas for, for everything by being in strange places. Because what is a strange place? It's a place where the architecture, um, all the entire physical environment is new. It's different. It's not just the people you meet. It's not just the language. It's everything about a place. The way buildings are built, the way roads work, the way people wait online or don't wait online. And in, in this strangeness or in this newness, suddenly I start to think about things in a different way. So I, I travel to get ideas. Um, and one of the things I do is I find that I, owe, I kind of look for, look for the issues that people are uncomfortable talking about. Um, because it's, it's inside the silences where the future often emerges. You know, search for the kind of the dirty little secret in a place. That, you know, the, the subject that if you bring it up at a dinner party, you'll, people will get suddenly very uncomfortable, um, you know, in a place. That kind of is where, you know, is where the problems of the future may lie. Is that uh, also the reason why you put so much emphasis um, uh, on the political culture of, of countries and on, on cultural differences? Well, I think the cultural similarities are increasingly known through the world media. So it's the differences that need to be exposed. Um, because we the idea that we're all the same is kind of a fiction. Let me give you an example. You may have an email friend in Bulgaria or Georgia or Egypt, but when you each move away from your computers, you're each encountering different realities, you know, different histories, different circumstances. So the global village is still a small village. It's still in the process of becoming. Mm -hmm. So for a few decades more, um, we're going to get a sense of the problems ahead and the opportunities ahead through what exists on the ground in all these places. I find, and this is something that Rob said to me last night, that often Western policy is a matter of projecting the reality seen in Western capitals onto other places. Whereas what I try to do is, I think my function is, is to project the reality in these other places upwards and backwards at Western capitals. You, you started uh, your book with an expose on, on the split running through the Balkans uh, and the split between Eastern Orthodoxy and uh, Western Christianity. Um, it, ha it held the, the, the spread of, uh, of Western European culture, uh, including Renaissance and Reformation, uh, and explains why these countries are so different. Uh, but what about the future? Do, do you think we can overcome these differences? Yes, I think we could certainly overcome them in the Balkans for the simple reason that the Balkans are next door to Central Europe and are a natural area for the expansion of Western prosperity and civil society. It's like a natural next step. Yeah, but, um, these, but these differences are, are very deeply rooted. Um, they're deeply rooted, but you know something? Um, if you look at Greece at the end of the Greek Civil War in 1949, when it was backward with no middle class, split by a civil war, enormously underdeveloped, um, and President Truman took the huge risk of pulling Greece into NATO within three years,
and, and that, that helped to change Greece. Now, Greece remained a very troublesome member of the NATO alliance and didn't join the EU until a generation later, um, in, in the late 1970s, I believe. But imagine how much worse Greece would have been and how much more trouble Greece would have caused the West had Truman not taken that step. So, you know, it's, it, these are difficult decisions, and, you know, we can have differences of opinion, but it's my belief that NATO now has to make a leap. It has to make a leap of faith to take in these other one or two countries at a time every few years who are in no worse a situation economically or politically. In fact, in some senses, more stable than Greece was at the end of its civil war. You say has to take a leap, has to enlarge uh, NATO, but will it enlarge NATO? Um, I can't answer that. I mean, that will depend a lot on the, uh, the, the, the personality and the advice and the instincts of the new president and on European leaders. Um, but I think that this is very seriously being considered. But if we enlarge Western institutions, such as NATO and the European uh, Union, where then does Europe end? Well, I, I think that as a practical matter, Europe should only concentrate on expanding in one or two places at a time. Because I know, I realize how difficult it was for the EU to integrate Greece and Portugal in the 1980s because I lived in Greece throughout the 1980s. And I saw that firsthand and it was very difficult. And I know that integrating places like Poland and Hungary are going to be equally, if not more, difficult. But as a public relations diplomatic matter, I think there should never be declared an end to Europe. There should always be the open possibility of others joining, because if you declare an end, then you suddenly, then, then the, the places just on the other side suddenly have no incentive to but, but do you, their but politics. Do you, have to the right do you have to declare an end, or is there a natural limit uh, to the expansion of, for example, NATO? Obviously, there will be some natural limit at some point. And is that limit uh, uh, um, there because of the cultural differences? It is now, but um, I'll tell you, I have two different opinions on, you know, on Professor Samuel Huntington's theory on the clash of civilizations. One is Professor Huntington is a brilliant um, social observer who's been proven right time and time again in the 50s, the late 60s with his other books. And his model is actually a very realistic model, though it is very uncomfortable for people. But I disagree with his conclusions. Um, his conclusions are that the West should stay where it is to strengthen itself, to get ready for this kind of, um, you know, this, this competition. Um, whereas I think we need to bridge these differences. Uh, uh, we, we need, because cause if, we, cause if we institutionalize these divisions, I think that it will be worse for Europe. I, know, I, uh, um, uh, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I, I think that, you, as I said earlier, that ultimately a stable Europe will require an extension of where Europe is now. And again, we can all disagree on how fast and how far that should go when. Yeah, uh, if I quote you correctly, uh, you said during your, your presentation, if we do not enlarge uh, Europe or uh, enlarge uh, uh, NATO, European Union, uh, we are in trouble. Uh, there will be uh, instability. But why? Why don't we leave these countries alone? Because if we leave these countries alone, well, let me give you the example of Romania. Romania, the, the most modernizing institution in Romania is the military. The military is further ahead than the other branches of government in modernization since the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And in other countries throughout the 20th century, when that has happened, you usually get a military coup or some sort of informal rule by the military at some point. Um, and if that happens in Romania, you're going to see a, a, a slowdown in investment. Uh, development is going to be curtailed. People are not going to have faith in it. And I think if these places don't have the opportunity to join Europe, they're, not, they're going to get poor. They're not going to develop. And then there are going to be more refugees. Um, they're, they're going to become more pregnant venues for organized crime from Russia, uh, for the drug trade, for the arms trade. And, and, and ultimately, that, that, that will hurt Europe. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I simply do not know that many politicians, for example, here in Europe, maybe in the US, uh, where you come from, uh, that are willing to allow these countries into the Western institutions. 
Well, obviously, NATO membership comes first. Greece and Turkey joined NATO um, a long, long time before G Greece joined the EU, and Turkey still has not gotten into the EU. Yeah, but that was a different time frame. Uh, that was uh, during, uh, that was after the Second World War, uh, when we had to fight communism. Uh, there is no communism anymore. Uh, so, uh, all kinds of other things happen. I, right I think now. we have other gray area threats, Rob. Uh, threats of organized crime, drugs, instability that will ultimately undermine Europe. Um, if you know, if if if, if, it, if Western European leaders do not consider this expansion, you, you gave us a, a an almost terrible picture of countries like Georgia and Azerbaijan. Uh, how should we deal with these countries? What should we do? Well, as the Georgians told me, nobody in Georgia expects NATO to bomb for ten weeks to save ethnic Georgians from ethnic Abkhazians. Well, when, there was when, an when, ethnic cleansing uh, when, when in, in the early 90s. Well, not? they don't expect it, because they looked at the Kosovo air. I was in Georgia during the Kosovo air war, mm -hmm. and the reactions were very sophisticated. On the one hand, people were impressed with just the, the, you know, the kind of brute show of NATO power, and it raised the, um, it raised the, um, the reputation of NATO dramatically among people who, who respect power because they've because their histories of those of weak or non-existent institutions. Where institutions are weak, power is is respected more. So the so the reputation of NATO went up in Azerbaijan and Georgia. But at the same time, people were realistic. They understood that the, this was the limit to which the United States was willing to go. But as people explained to me, we don't need 10 weeks of bombing now or ever. <laughs> what we need is all kinds of quiet help, uh, secure, you know, security help, um, help in building institutions, um, uh, you know, help in protecting the president. You know, there's all kinds of foreign aid you know, we can spend an evening talking about that on the one hand is not kind of just isolationism where you do nothing, and on the other hand is not 10 weeks of bombing. And the more, the more attention you pay early, the less risk you face of even having, say, an American president and Lord Robertson having to face difficult decisions of intervention. But what makes you think that these countries are willing to accept our, our help? Uh, because when I, I just visited uh, Kazakhstan, for example, uh, two, uh, a month ago, and uh, I found that, well, uh, we do not, we, the West, simply do not have a very good reputation in that, uh, that part of uh, the world because they see us as a kind of imperialist and uh, they say, well, we can do our own business. How to change this? Well, my experience in Georgia and Azerbaijan and Armenia, um, which is sympathetic to the Russians, unlike these other two places, um, and even in Turkmenistan was quite different. Um, I felt that the reputation of America particularly uh, was very high um, and that these places didn't want to be forgotten, but at the same time they realized they were too far afield from Europe ever to get into European institutions. But um, I think we have to approach them the same way we approach stability and preserving stability in Tunisia, which is on the southern rim. Um, if for Europe to prosper, I believe, it needs stability and growth in the areas that may always stay outside Europe, but which are peripheral to Europe, um, so as to have trading partners, regional stability, etc. Aren't you an optimist? Because uh, in, in you, your book uh, you wrote, and I quote, Azerbaijan uh, looked even poorer than I remembered it. Yeah. Um, how, how come, despite the booming oil business? You know, I like being accused of being an optimist because so few people. You're an American. It. I mean, you know, it real. I mean, it'll be good for my reputation if more people um, um, uh, say that. Yeah, Azerbaijan is probably the place that I worry about most in the entire book of all the countries between Central Europe and Central Asia, Hungary and Turkmenistan, um, you know, Romania in the north, Israel in the south. Um, that if I had to guess what one country that is now nowhere on the radar screen is going to cause a nightmare for Western policy, or say two countries, 
in the world, I would pick Azerbaijan and Pakistan for two completely different reasons. Of course, there are other places that are more risky, but they're already on the radar screen. Um, and for the reasons stated in the book, because you have all this big oil wealth coming in and it's all being stolen. So much of it is being misused. And this is even before the wall of money comes in. Because right now, all the oil wealth is from, merely from signing contracts, from bonuses. Um, the actual revenues from pumping the oil have still not arrived yet, yet there are no institutions to use this money wisely. And when we look at the instability in Venezuela, in Mexico, in Nigeria, soon after big oil emerged, you, uh, you, uh, you've got to be worried. Is it a failed state then, Azerbaijan? Because I think you, you wrote in your book uh, that the, the central government has little influence outside Baku. It, and, and they virtually lost uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. It's a failed state. In this, it's one of those places where you have t anarchy that masquerades as tyranny for, um, uh, for the time being. Because the difference between anarchy and tyranny is like as thin as a, as thin as a thread. Um, one usually kind of maintains the other, controls the other. Talking about uh, Azerbaijan, uh, you, you seem to be intrigued uh, by the Armenians. Why is that so? Yes. Well, because throughout the book, I spent, you know, I didn't talk about Turkey tonight, but there are quite a yeah, few yeah. chapters on Turkey. So I spent a lot of time in the book in Turkey, and Turkey's like the, um, it was my base of operations for many of these countries. And, and so, and not only did I spend time in Turkey, Azerbaijan is ethnic Turk. Um, Georgia is heavily influenced by the Turks. You meet Turks everywhere. Yeah. And I was very, you know, I like Turkey, and I think that comes out in the book. But I felt that I didn't want to, you know, fall into this trap of being an area expert with clientitis. Yep. And I felt I had to see the other side. Um, so I decided to end the book with an epilogue on Armenia. Um, and so I did that. And, um, and Armenia, by the way, is physically magnificent. It's one of the most interesting landscapes you can imagine. And it's filled with the most beautiful old churches, um, where um, old Armenian churches, you really see the kind of connection of kind of the pagan classical culture merging into early Christianity. Um, and, 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 and so I ended the book in Armenia, even though um, I, I think Ar Armenia will always be a state, though it may not be a very nice state or it may not be a very successful state. Uh, one thing about Armenia that was really a theme throughout this book, it's that in many of these countries I did not encounter citizens, I encountered subjects. Um, while, is, while there's all this talk of Armenian nationalism and the government uses the language of Armenian nationalism and Armenian groups use that language, when you actually get into the mundane conversations with Armenians, it's all about physical survival. Um, you know, surviving the next paycheck, you know, the next meal. It's such a backbreakingly poor country. I mean, if perhaps you remember in 1988 there was a terrible earthquake in northern Armenia that occupied the news for a long time. Well, right after that, the Soviet Union collapsed, so there was no rebuilding because the people who promised the rebuilding were no longer in power because there wasn't a country anymore. And, the, and people still live in wagons. They still live in shacks after their homes were destroyed 13 years ago. You, you really gave a very rational answer to my question, but isn't there more? Uh, you, you are, again, you are intrigued by the Armenians, and, it, and indeed, it's very interesting. But has your own background something to do with this? You're, sure. You're, you're Jewish. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and what I found, one of the things you take away when you're from an ethnic group is that ethnicity matters. It's a reality. And, and one of the problems I find with intellectual discourse since the end of the post-Cold War is because of the fall of the Berlin Wall, some people have declared like an end to groups, that, you know, that there is no such thing as group reality anymore. We're all just kind of mushy individuals in some global meeting hall. Um, but of course, Individuals are certainly more concrete than the groups of which they're composed. Nevertheless, those groups still have reality. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so not to, talk, to assume that they don't exist 
that they don't have particular person, and what is a national characteristic? It's merely a people's experience in a particular geography throughout hundreds or thousands of years of history. That's all it is. And because and because history changes, events change, um, cultural characteristics are constantly changing and evolving. And probably ultimately, because of mass communications and air tra technology, on some future morrow, there will be no such thing as group characteristics. But at least for the next few decades, they're real, and they can help us understand what, perhaps the parameters of what is possible in a number of these countries. But there's more, I think, if I uh, read your book correctly. Um, the Amer uh, Armenian, uh, Armenian genocide. Yes. Yes. 600,000 to one and a half million people were killed or exiled. Is, is, there, is there a parallel uh, between the making of Israel and the making of the Armenian state? Well, I'm not sure that there's a parallel. Well, in a way there is. Uh, one of the things I go into, well, two issues. The genocide gave Armenia a national identity that the Azeri Turks in Azerbaijan lack. And that's, uh, that was another factor in why the Armenians were able to win the war in Nagorno-Karabakh. The other issue is that during the war in Bosnia, um, the, um, there was constantly a, a, a connection made by journalists, diplomats, many other people uh, with the Nazi Holocaust against Jews. But if you actually look at the events in Bosnia and their complexity of genocide occurring within the context of a civil war, you find that the Armenian genocide is a more accurate comparison that you can learn more about one by comparing it to the other. And that the only reason the Armenian Holocaust was not invoked was because people knew less about it. People just knew more about the Nazi Holocaust, so that was the metaphor, the comparison that they used. Um, but as I point out in the book, that the complexities of the Armenian Holocaust helps us understand the murders in Indonesia today that are ongoing, and I think a lot of other um, ethnic unrest and, and disturbances and killings of one group against the other throughout the, the developing world and perhaps into the future. Turkey has still considerable problems in accepting uh, this genocide. What, what does it mean? Um, I think what does it, it tell means, us about uh, Turkey? It, it's kind of like Croatia. Um, you can, it's hard to expect nations that are not quite modern and are still fighting for survival to have the self-confidence to confront their own past. Croatia never confronted its own past because, um, because it was locked in under Tito's communism and then fought a war with Serbia. But I think if you see Croatia modernize and develop, you will see groups of Croatian intellectuals starting to ask questions about the 1940s and Europe and all of that. And I think as Turkey develops, um, as it becomes, and it is modernizing, that's why it had its currency crisis, because currency crises are, uh, you know, are aspects of, of, uh, of, uh, of modernization. As Turkey becomes wealthier and more established and more self-confident, I'm sure you're going to see groups of Turkish intellectuals and others start to ask questions and renew this issue. Is Turkey a Western or an Eastern country? I, I think Turkey is both. Turkey's a, a, a very dynamic place that's always on the cusp of modernization. Um, it's always more impressive and stable when you're there than when you read about it in the newspapers. Um, there are, no, there are some countries where the reality is worse, but others where the reality is better. And Turkey's one of those places where you just cannot capture the dynamism uh, within the strictures of, of, of hard news journalistic copy. Before giving uh, uh, the, uh, or asking uh, the four for uh, uh, questions, let me ask you to explain the last sentence of your book. Uh, you and you, uh, you write, uh, we will require Western leaders who understand power and the use of it. Leaders who know to intervene and do so without illusions. Right. Um, there are two aspects to that. Uh, th they didn't hear it. They didn't hear yeah, it. You have to read it loud. Western leaders are required to understand power and the use of it. Leaders who know when to intervene and do so without illusions. Yes. Um, there will be disturbances and outrages in many places of the world on a frequent uh, level because of the problems I said in my talk about urbanization, youth bulges, 
shortages of water, which are going to provoke more uh, political and ethnic violence. And the West cannot intervene e everywhere. So it has to be very selective. But for, and, for what reasons? Um, Is it for humanitarian reasons or uh, to protect our own interests? For both. And, and, and the best kind of interventions are when moral and strategic imperatives intersect. And where if you make an, intersect, uh, an intervention in one place, it increases your reputation for power in other places. Um, and to do so without illusions means that one, one should not romanticize or idealize a people or a region in order to take, uh, to take action and intervention. 102 years ago, Winston Churchill, when he was 25 years old, published a book called The River War about the British conquest of the Sudan. Um, and Churchill goes on for hundreds of pages about the intractability of the landscape, about the difficulty, the underdevelopment, the hopelessness. But yet then he comes to the conclusion that it's in Britain's interest to intervene. And because as he says, um, these difficulties of, you know, of culture, landscape, etc., merely provide opportunities that moral men surmount and overcome. I can go on for hours, but uh, l let me stop here and ask you if there are any questions. And there are microphones hmm. here. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, you have spoken about uh, the Caucasus, where you foresee uh, looser and uh, uh, more shifting sovereignty and authority. Now that to me appears to be uh, an ideal and fertile ground for organized crime to, uh, yeah. uh, to live on. And it's just around the corner from Russia. Could you expand upon yes, that? Yes, um, that's a great question. If you look at the history of organized crime, you see that what is corruption or organized crime, when we think about it, are simply alternative power networks. When official governmental power works are either power networks are either too weak, disorganized, or unable to supply the goods that people want, the physical protection, um, and the, the services, and other things. So these unofficial networks, mafias, clans, whatever you want to call it, provide some of these services. This was the situation in late medieval Sicily, and it was the situation after the collapse of the communist empire because of the way that the Berlin Wall collapsed. Um, there wasn't a gradual transition from totalitarianism to more benign dictatorship into democracy. In many places, you had immediate parliamentary democracy replaced totalitarianism. And so because there were no institutions, that merely created a vacuum of power, which was filled by various oligarchical crime groups uh, in, in, in the Caucasus, in Russia, and elsewhere. And I think that this is a problem we're going to continue to have as long as, as until these places build institutions um, through one means or another. And I think, you know, one of the, the biggest problems of, of, of leaving Romania and Bulgaria and some of these other countries to their own devices and just kind of keeping them permanently out of Europe is they are going to become real feeding grounds for Russian organized crime. The fact that the, the, that the Warsaw Pact collapsed, it doesn't mean that these countries are not still in play, are not still up for grabs. Uh, they, they are up for grabs until, w through one gradual means or another, we can incorporate them into the Western system. I think, yeah, in the back. So I noticed that you mentioned Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia, but you never mentioned Albania. And don't you think that Albania, with its uh, self-destructive population in Albania itself, with Kosovo and its frustration, with Albanians all around, are perhaps the most big, the biggest threats of uh, peace in the Balkans? Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, in, in my earlier book, Balkan Ghosts, I dealt with Albania, um, but very little in this book. Um, in the 1990s, the problem for the West was how to deal with Serbian nationalism and Milosevic. I think the problem for the coming decade is how to deal with Albanian nationalism. Um, and one of the, the 
particular difficulties with Albania and areas of the southern Balkans where Albanians live is that we're talking about the poorest part of Europe. And not only the poorest part of Europe, but the part of Europe through which many trade routes come through uh, from the Middle East upwards into Central Europe, routes of crime, of drugs, of, of money laundering, of prostitution, of arms. So that many of the motives of some of these groups are not entirely political. Um, it's also simply to take and occupy territory to get the money from this contraband traffic. Um, and, and when you've got, we're talking about a region where unemployment is sky high, many young men with nothing to do, weak governments, and the opportunities tend to be in crime. So we're going to face constant, I think, Albanian guerrilla activity for reasons in addition to national self-determination. Um, and I think it's an issue that NATO is simply going to have to, you know, a lot of problems have no easy solution in history. There is no magic bullet negotiating diplomatic formula. You just kind of work at the issue day in and day out through various means and hope over the years you can kind of jumpstart some kind of economic development at some point that makes it easier for you. I mean, we worked at the issue for years in Bosnia, and then you know we, we, got, a, we got a break. We got rid of a, of a bad regime in Croatia, and a year later, rid of a bad regime in, in, in Belgrade. So little by little, you make progress. And have some understanding of the problems and the people there. Uh, another question. Yes, please. First off, I wanted to say, your books have given me many sleepless nights, so <laughs> gosh. Uh, I've lived outside the States for 22 years now, and um, I see, particularly with our current president, the United States is becoming more isolationist in their approach to the world. In a time when it appears that you need stronger leadership, uh, do you think that Europe will fill the void? And uh, what do you think of this approach of the current administration? Um, I think that the, uh, the current administration is going to surprise a lot of people um, and be more proactive in foreign policy um, than many people think. Um, I think that it will, uh, it will strengthen the alliances that we already have. Um, the current administration has a lot of things on its mind. Um, you know, it really has to face up to these issues of, chem of like, the worst nightmare, a chemical biological version of Pearl Harbor, or something of that variation. Um, and the current administration, I think, is thinking very seriously along the lines of NATO expansion about the problems of the current administration is dealing with talks between the Azeris and Armenians, which I believe is going to resume in Florida in two weeks or so. I'm not sure of the dates. Uh, the current administration is active in talks between, you know, pro, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in India, Pakistan, Kashmir. Simply because it doesn't get into the newspaper doesn't mean it's not active. Yes, please. I would like to know which languages you speak. I speak quite a few extremely badly, and uh, I, the only one I kind of speak well is English. Um, but um, within two weeks, I can kind of deal in, in any one of a few languages because of previous studies. And what I do is when I go to a country, is it also, it's not just speaking to people, it's just watching how things work. Because um, people often tell you what they want you to believe or what, or, or what they want, or, or, they, or they think they want to believe. But what I do is, uh, when I pick translators, I don't go to like official government or that kind of things, or to hotels. I try to search out young people on colleges, campuses, in all of these countries, and find people whose ideas are not formed themselves, so they don't have a political line to give you who are discovering their own country and society at the same time that you are, so that it's an adventure for them as well as for you. And, and this worked well for me, I think, in Uzbekistan, which was in a previous book. Um, and it's led to a lot of great friendships. More questions? Yes, please, yeah. Main concerns. 
don't understand it as well. Uh, can, uh, could, could, I, I, I don't you follow the it? question exactly. Okay. Yes, the environment in the ex-Soviet Union is not an aesthetic issue or a lifestyle issue. It's a strategic issue because the environmental destruction is far worse than anything we can imagine. Um, you have soils that are diseased with oil and other chemical pollutants. And as anyone in the West knows how expensive it is to replace soils, it costs a fortune. Um, you know, in the West, if you have more than a few parts per million of oil in soil, um, alarm bells go off, you know, governmental agencies get involved. But you have whole countries, uh, or parts of whole countries, where this is the case. Um, you've also had the destruction of the landscape through various kinds of mono agriculture, like the cotton culture in Central Asia. Um, so this, and, and the real importance of this is this is going to put a drag on these countries' economies for many years to come. Because in, you know, because you know, air pollution is much more, it's much less expensive and easier to resolve than water and soil pollution. Um, so uh, this is going to this is going to provide a, you know an additional problem. Another question. Going back to your expose on Iran in Ends of the Earth, how would you perceive the role of Iran um, given the new political situation in Central Asia? More specifically, going back to your comment on Iranian support um, in Azerbaijan and yeah. the very, very large Armenian diaspora within right. Iran. Yeah. Um, I was I was very optimistic about Iran and the ends of the earth in 1996 because I saw in Iran a, a, a society that was much more civil than those in the ex-Soviet Union like Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan. And going from Iran, from those countries to Iran was like coming back to Western civilization in a way. Even though the West or the United States had no relations with Iran and it did already have defensive pacts with some of those other countries. Um, I think that right now in Iran, you kind of have three separate governments in a way. You've got uh, 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 Khamenei and the goons in the security services. You've got the democratically elected president, Khatami, and you still have Rafsanjani, who's sort of a mediator, a power center all his own. And because of that division of power, which is great if you're talking abstractly about democracy, because the more divided power is, the less oppressive sometimes it is. Um, it makes it even more difficult for the U.S. government to have a, a rapprochement the way that Nixon did with China. Because when Nixon dealt with China, there was just one power center to deal with and just two or three people to deal with. But one of the problems the U.S. has is it's got three separate power centers. And so if you work with one, the other two kind of gang up against you and, and, um, and use it against you. I think that um, you, I, I find that Iran has a lot to worry about on its northern border. Um, because it's got a growing oil rich Azerbaijan. It's got, I think it's 20, 20 million ethnic Azeris south of the border uh, in the Tabriz area. So there's this kind of mini state of southern Azerbaijan. Um, and then it has all kinds of, 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 of Turkmen and other nationalisms uh, coming to the fore. Um, and there are t ethnic Turkmen groups inside Iran. I, you know, there's, there's, you know, the, uh, Turkmen Bashi, the, it's, uh, Niyazov, the president of Turkmenistan, is really promoting this kind of Turkmen irredentism, Turkmen nationalism, which makes the Iranians um, um, also nervous. So I think what we're going to see increasingly is um, we're going to see, uh, well, we're going to continue to see the uh, Iranian-Armenian alliance, even though the Armenians are Christians. Um, because it works against the Azeris, who the uh, Iranians are worried about. And I think that as we see the real post-communist transformation in Central Asia, which we haven't seen yet, because we're still dealing with communist era rulers, we're going to see more instability in Central Asia, and that is going to increase the role of Iran. It's going to make Iran even more central. I think we can take two more questions, please. 
Uh, you've talked a lot about uh, power structures or, or lack of. You haven't said a lot about the role of Islam. Yeah. Uh, yes, the role of is Islam. Um, most of this area of the world, about two-thirds that I went through was Islamic. Um, but Islam is divided against itself, too. Um, uh, Azeris are... Um, <coughs> Azeris may be Shiites, but they, they're very secular because of seven decades of communism. Uh, so they don't see Islam in the same way that Iranians do. Um, Turkmen's also see it very differently. Um, you know, the, the Iranians are not happy with what's going on in Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan is not in my book, but I wrote an earlier book on Afghanistan. And what really defines the Taliban is not so much Islam, but the total lack of urbanization. Um, in, in Afghanistan's history, so that you don't have a sophisticated urban culture ruling the society. Iran is highly urbanized, highly developed. You have kind of rural backwoodsmen who have been educated in extremist Islamic academies. Um, and that is part of the phenomenon that has created Taliban. So I think as Islam becomes more central in Central Asia, because as this post-communist power structure collapses, one of the only things there is Islam, you're not going to see a unity of Islam. You're going to see different kinds of Islam that, is going to compete, that, that are each going to be competing. Final question. Yes. Um, what I do is not so much make predictions, but just look at the present from the point of view of the past and kind of get some kind of vague sense of where a region may be heading. And um, a lot, you know, it, it's very often that you're wrong. I, mean, um, in, uh, I was a bit too optimistic about Iranian political evolution in the ends of the earth. Um, when I finished Balkan Ghosts, if somebody had asked me, where will the Balkans really ignite, I would have said between the Hungarians and the Romanians, um, not in Bosnia. Um, uh, I, think I, I think I was a bit too pessimistic about Syria in the book, given, uh, given the, uh, given the uh, change. And I think uh, Bashar Assad has not done too badly in the last year. Of course, we have to give it time. Um, and, I, and things in Israel look very good when I finished writing this book, and so I may have been a bit too optimistic about Israel at the time. Maybe with this book, my problem has been that I've been too optimistic in too many places, <laughs> but we'll find out. Well, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, uh, we have to, to, to round off. Um, I have two small questions. Next travel, next book? Um, I'm finishing a small book on how ancient uh, philosophy can improve critical thinking in foreign policy. And then I'm going to uh, do some travels through North Africa. And that will re result in a new book as well? We'll see. Okay. Yeah. Well, Robert, thank you very much. I think we had a, a wonderful evening. Uh, at least I enjoyed it, but I think uh, <laughs> I speak on behalf of uh, the public uh, when I say that we enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So I, I will not make uh, the closing remarks, uh, so I would ask to ask, there is already Reed Fendrick, the Chargé d'Affaires of the U.S. Embassy in The Hague, uh, to make some closing remarks. Thank you very much, Rob. And Mr. Kaplan, that was a fascinating uh, evening, fascinating lecture across a great sweep of the uh, modern world. Thank you. Um, Robert Kaplan will be signing books in the lobby in the back. And uh, in a few minutes, if you just give him a chance uh, after I finish to uh, get back there and to sign the books.